Welcome back everybody. Today I want to talk about how CO2 saves the Earth's climate. And if that sounds a little odd, what I'm trying to show is that there are both warming and cooling effects of greenhouse gases, which are equally important for maintaining a livable planet. Now, if you want to experience in real time how changing greenhouse gases can affect climate, I advise you to step away from the mass media and their bogus narratives and go camping in the desert. Now, deserts are defined by the lack of water, the dominant greenhouse gas. And without water vapor and clouds, solar heating increases and temperatures average 100 degrees or more. Similarly, in heat waves that are associated with dryness, there's an increased amount of solar heating, even though the lack of water decreases greenhouse warming. At night, due to the lack of moisture, heat waves are able to escape to space much more quickly. So you have a dramatic drop in temperatures and temperatures at night will drop to about 25 degrees. So the addition of a greenhouse gas like water will moderate these extreme temperature extremes. Now, based on observations such as the rapid cooling in the desert, the climate theory that's more fashionable right now is that more CO2 warms the planet and less CO2 cools the planet. And based on that theory, climate models speculate that without any greenhouse gases whatsoever, the Earth's temperature would hover around zero degrees Fahrenheit, meaning all water on Earth would freeze and life as we know it would fail to exist. Thankfully, the greenhouse effect warms the Earth's temperature now to about 59 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very livable for all forms of life. Still, that theory is flawed. Now, based on the current climate theory, climate models can't readily explain why, when the ancient Earth had extremely high concentrations of carbon dioxide, that the average temperature on Earth might have been 92 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, and then plunged to the snowball Earth. When CO2 concentrations were around 10,000 parts per million, we experienced the Maranoan Glacier for about 20 million years. And that is what prompted the idea of the snowball Earth. Likewise, the Ordovician Glacier lasted for about 20 million years, when CO2 concentrations were about 4,400 parts per million. Now, probably what the bigger effect was was the continents were configured in a much different way, which caused ocean and air circulation to change the way heat was transported around the world. Now, we can infer the composition of ancient Earth's atmosphere by examining the atmosphere of our nearest neighbors. Mars, although it has a much thinner atmosphere, had 95% carbon dioxide and very little nitrogen and oxygen. Venus, with a much thicker atmosphere, had around 96% concentration of carbon dioxide and again, very little nitrogen and oxygen. In contrast, the Earth's current atmosphere contains just 0.04% carbon dioxide and 21% uh, oxygen and 78% nitrogen. Now we can attribute that change to the evolution of life on Earth, where photosynthesis sequestered more CO2 and generated an abundance of oxygen and fostered the accumulation of nitrogen. Now, with the advances in satellite observations, we can approximate how much en energy is entering the Earth from the sun and then how much energy the, the Earth can radiate back to space. Now, we can tell that approximately of the energy from the sun that's reaching the Earth, about a third directly warms the atmosphere and another uh, greater than two thirds warms the surface of the Earth. Together, that adds up to about 240 watts per meter squared. Now, if any of that energy is trapped and not released back to space, then the Earth will warm. And, and that is a good theoretical science. There's no argument there. But then you must consider that the calculations we have to date have a large range of uncertainty. Still, as we measure how much uh, infrared rays are leaving the Earth and going out to outer space, 
the calculations is about 239.7 watts per meter squared. So it's just a very little difference they assume is being trapped. But still, that little difference is being claimed to be causing a climate crisis and lead to a threatening of extinction of life. Now, one good part of our understanding of this uh, global warming is that we can understand why the Earth is not cooling as quickly as it should. As infrared heat radiates back to space, greenhouse gases intercept it and then recycle it by sending more of it back to the Earth. But eventually, that radiation finally escapes. And in addition to about 53 watts per meter square that, that leaves the surface, the more important uh, energy that leaves is leaving via latent heating and sensible heating. And then again, understand that this imbalance that is calculated at about 0 0.6 watts per meter squared has an uncertainty range of about 17 watts per meter squared. Now, such a wide range of uncertainty says that the science is unsettled and we do not know whether the Earth is really warming or heating or cooling. Now, the heating of the troposphere, the lower atmosphere that we live in and that is the home for all the weather events, is heated primarily by latent and sensible heating. And that heating is first started by heating when the sun heats the ground. The ground vibrates more rapidly due to that heat and transfers that energy to the atmosphere above it by collisions in a process known as conduction. Now, when the air gets hotter, it's more energetic and the molecules spread out and the air becomes less dense. Less dense air is more buoyant and rises. So this is the way sensible heat leaves the surface and rises out towards space. Now, that vacuum created by uh, the rising heat is now replaced by cold, dense air that is less buoyant and sinks. But the problem with this scenario is without greenhouse gases, the, the air above would never cool and never sink back to the earth. Now that brings up another flaw in current greenhouse climate change theory. Greenhouse gases are absolutely vital for cooling the atmosphere as well as warming. Heat absorbed by oxygen and nitrogen, which makes up 99% of our atmosphere, are not greenhouse gases and they cannot radiate their heat back to space. In order to radiate the heat back to space that they absorb from the surface, they must transfer that heat via collision to a greenhouse gas, which then can radiate the heat back to space. As life evolved, cooling rates slowed as rising concentrations of non-greenhouse gases had to be cooled by less and less greenhouse gases. And the good news is that more CO2 should increase the cooling rate. So the question arises, why doesn't the air that's very cool in the upper atmosphere simply sink to the ground? Well, the answer is that the temperature of the air is heated and cooled by radiation as well as adiabatic heating and cooling. Now, dry air will cool as it rises adiabatically by about 9.8 degrees centigrade for every thousand meters it rises. Recent studies show that the heating of the Earth's surface from greenhouse gases originates mostly from the atmospheric layers that are about 1,600 meters or less. So we can infer from that that atmospheric layers above 1,600 meters, greenhouse, greenhouse gases are mostly involved in cooling. So what is the effect of adiabatic heating? Now, adiabatic heating is, is described by the gas laws that we've known for 100 years. And very simply, it means that air cools when there's less pressure and the air warms when there's more pressure. Now, due to gravity, 
Our atmosphere is the densest with the most pressure near the surface in the least amount of density in least amount of pressure as you rise in altitude. So as air rises, it experiences less pressure and it cools. However, if there is no radiative cooling whatsoever, that air parcel as it sinks will now heat back to the exact same temperature it was before it rose. Now, if you want to understand this concept of how pressure can cause heating, get a fire syringe. It's great for kids to understand or yourself, and there's versions for such scientific demonstrations for kids, or you can take camping. But you press down on the plunger, it increases the pressure, and it will ignite a piece of paper. Now, if the limited amount of greenhouse gases fail to fully release the heat that oxygen and nitrogen absorb from the surface, then the air will more rapidly warm as it descends. And the warm air over cooler air creates what's known as an inversion layer that traps the heat. Now, if you spend any time outdoors during the autumn and the winter in rural areas where people are heating with wood-burning stoves, you'll see this odd vision of rising smoke that suddenly hits this glass ceiling and goes sideways. What you're witnessing is an inversion layer. The smoke cannot rise past the warm air above it. So we know that these inversion layers commonly occur at night and in the winter because the Earth's surface radiates heat away more rapidly than the atmosphere can. And the longer the nights, the more rapidly the surface can cool. Now these uh, inversions often erode during the daytime when solar heating can offset the cooling. Now to understand why the Earth's surface cools much more quickly than the atmosphere, we have to understand how different wavelengths of energy interacts with the atmosphere. The upper panel shows how the Sun and the Earth emit different wavelengths of energy. The middle panel shows how water vapor absorbs those energies. And the bottom panel shows how carbon dioxide absorbs those energies. Well, the Sun, because it reaches 6,000 degrees Kelvin, emits most of its energy in very short wavelengths. Water vapor can absorb some of those wavelengths which is why the sun can directly warm the atmosphere to a limited degree. CO2 is much less effective. The Earth, because it warms only to 255 degrees Kelvin, emits all its energy in the long wavelengths. Water vapor can absorb maybe 60% of those wavelengths. CO2 is limited to absorbing a very narrow band of wavelengths, but this band of wavelengths is important because it is the peak of where the Earth radiates energy, the 13.5 to 17 microns. Now, the good news is, is although this has helped heat the Earth to where it is now in a comfortable 59 degrees average temperature, it is now saturated. So any additional CO2 is not going to increase warming by that much. And why does the surface cool so quickly? Well, there's an atmospheric window where there are no greenhouse gases to intercept the infrared energy that's being radiated back to space. So the Earth's surface can cool much more quickly. Now, farmers have benefited from their understanding of the warm inversion layer. Because the Earth cools much more rapidly, it presents frost damage to their crops. To prevent that, they've installed fans which pulls down the warm air from that inversion layer, warming the surface and preventing frost damage. Now, inversion layers can also be deadly when they're associated with extreme heat waves. Now, extreme heat waves are associated with descending air currents. Those descending air currents warm adiabatically and create inversion layers. But high pressure domes that are also created by descending air cause those inversion layers to persist for days longer than would normally happen with just a nighttime inversion. The circulation pattern pulls warm air from the south and intensifies that inversion. And this leads to the extreme heat wave. 
Now, under normal conditions, the sun warms the Earth's surface, which warms the lower atmosphere, and that warmer air rises by convection towards the upper troposphere. But when a heat dome and an inversion layer are established, that prevents further convection. As an inversion layer prevents convection, it traps smog, and that adversely affects humans' health. That prevention of convection also amplifies heating. And to understand this concept, simply sit in your car at noon and roll the windows up. Within minutes, you'll feel very uncomfortable with the rising heat. And if those conditions persist, it can be deadly. This is why people are warned not to leave their pets in their car with the windows rolled up. Now, climate change in extreme weather is clearly complex. And greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and water have both warming and cooling effects. But are those effects so unbalanced that we are creating a climate crisis that threatens us like the mass media propagandizes? Now, although CO2's greenhouse warming has gratefully increased the Earth's average temperature to about 59 degrees Fahrenheit, the wavelengths that CO2 absorbs are now saturated. And that means that additional CO2 will have a very reduced warming effect. On the other hand, Increasing CO2 will allow more collisions between oxygen and nitrogen and allow more heat to radiate back to space. And this cooling seems to offset the warming and reduces, also reduces the inversion layer heating. So based on all the science, CO2 moderates warming and cooling and maintains a climate balance. The climate change we're now experiencing is driven primarily by solar and landscape changes and natural oscillations like El Ninos and La Ninas that affect ocean and air circulation, the same as it ever was. The climate crisis is really a concocted fiction driven by clickbait media, and I suggest you ignore it. Up next will be why emperor penguins are thriving. But until then, Embrace renowned scientist Thomas Huxley's advice that skepticism is our highest of duties and blind faith the one unpardonable sin. And if you appreciate the science clearly presented here, science rarely presented by mainstream media, then please give this a like, share it, or copy the URL and share it via email, subscribe to my channel, or read my book, Landscapes and Cycles, an Environmentalist Journey to Climate Skepticism. Thank you.